to all of you here and to our online audience for the last of the Sussex Development Lectures before Christmas, but a really special one. So I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome Hilary Cotton, who is a very important alumna of IDS. Um, she actually studied here on the NPhil in Development Studies between 91 and 93. Um, and we were together here, it was the first couple of years that I was working here as a fellow, and I used to spend quite a lot of time with Hilary. Since then, it's been a long gap um, in which she has done some absolutely amazing things. So just to list some of them, she went on from IDS to work at the World Bank, spent a lot of time doing participatory poverty assessments in, in Southern Africa. Um, she then did a PhD at the Open University, working in very impoverished areas of the Dominican Republic in cities. She did a postdoc at LSE. Um, and then she moved into wanting to work in the UK, and this is really significant to the story she will <coughs> tell this evening. Um, and she actually ended up working around urban issues in the context of design. Um, designing schools, schools that work for people, working with the red team of the Design Council here in the UK, where she became really rather famous for leading some extraordinarily exciting social design work. And then 10 years ago, she founded an organization called Participle. And through Participle, and actually through the reflection and the book that she has recently produced, she has done a transformative thing of bringing the learning from many years' experience around participation, participatory methods, participation in development in other parts of the world into the context of debates in the UK. So sitting squarely within the aspirations that we have at IDS to work locally and globally within a universal frame of development, and of course very much in line with the universal aims of the SDGs. Um, so I think we've got a treat in store to hear from Hilary. She's going to talk about the book and I think the things that led up to it. Um, you're then all very warmly invited to join us downstairs in the upper common room um, for drinks and for a little bit of a celebration to launch again the book. I think it's been launched in the book, but this is an IDS Sussex SDL launch, and the book will be available to buy at a discounted price. And I think Hilary might also sign some copies if you'd, if you'd like that. Um, so please feel free, as always, to tweet um, from the lecture using the at Sussex Dev hashtag. Um, be aware that it's being live streamed, so when you come to questions, um, be aware of that. And without further ado, I will turn over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. So I think I'm, I'm going to stand here so that I'm kind of in the, in the screen. Um, so it's really nice to be here. I think it's uh, 30 years since I was last here. And so it's kind of a bit like going home. You know, you kind of go back in your, in your teenage bedroom and you kind of feel kind of quite comfortable, but also not quite sure what's going to happen. You might kind of revert to teenage behaviour. And I don't think I can kind of revert to teenage behaviour, but it is quite weird. Luckily, I don't think anybody who actually taught me is here in the <laughs> audience, which actually kind of does make my sort of stress levels go down a bit. But um, as Melissa said, the first half of my career was in international development. And I've been working since the late 90s. It's about the year 2000 in the UK. And over the last 10 years, I've been basically building new forms of welfare bottom-up. So what I've been doing is, I've got to work out how the clicker works. Is it going to go, which way is it going to go? Um, on the, on the out. Right. Oh, there it goes, okay. It's fine, it's right. <laughs> um, so basically, with, with um, communities and people, including these ladies here, across Britain, I've been building alternative services, which I roll out as social enterprises, looking at kind of how we can support the great ageing in the UK, how we can support families who are facing all kinds of problems and so on. Um, and so, uh, it's quite UK focused, I'm going to kind of talk a bit about the developmental aspects, but then later you can kind of ask me questions, I hope you can have a good discussion about what translates, what doesn't translate, what some of the challenges are with the work that you're doing. So, oh, I'm going backwards. Why am I going backwards? There we go. Okay, I'll figure it out eventually. So, one of the challenges I talk about in the book, and one of the chapters, is dedicated to the story of finding good work. Because I don't know how many of you here are kind of rich, but if you are out of work in Britain, there is a service for you 
it looks like this, and what happens is you go along and you join the queue, and you get welfare benefits, and you get advice on how to get a job. And really there are now computers on the desks, and of course the benefits have been kind of massively cut. But essentially, uh, it's still the same service that was designed uh, by somebody called William Beveridge at the end of the Second World War, and we've got these 1940 services, same system, join the queue, get advice, get benefits. And the thing is that these systems in the UK cost billions to run, and they have a 66% failure rate. So in my work, what I say is, you know, why would we expect in the modern world that services we designed at the end of the Second World War could work today? I think it's not surprising. And we're going through this Industrial Revolution. I use the term Fifth Industrial Revolution because I draw on the work of um, Carl de Paris, who's an honorary professor here at Screw. Many of you might know of her work. And this fifth industrial revolution is based on obviously digital, the possibilities of hyperconnectivity, AI, biotech, and so on. And it's transforming our societies and economies everywhere. And in particular, of course, the world of work is being dramatically transformed by all this kind of sort of tech, the world of tech, it sort of very, very broadly. And in most parts of the world, work is becoming increasingly precarious. I know that you had a kind of uh, recent IDS bulletin on, on work in Africa. Um, and in Britain, kind of part-time precarious work counts for the biggest amount of job growth. And by 2020, over half of us will have no formal employer at all. So the kind of jobs available through this system are also kind of diminishing. So I tried an experiment. And I went uh, to a job centre in South London with a kind of great and visionary uh, manager. And I said, you know, could we put up a false door in here? We put up posters that said, you know, this system isn't working. And then we kind of hacked up a false door that said, get me out of here. And we said to everybody in the job centre, if you want to kind of try a different approach to finding work, you can give us five pounds and you can come through our door. And actually so many people wanted to come through the door that we had to keep raising the price by the hour. We got to kind of 20 pounds. We still had too many people. And we basically had to kind of shut the door. But people want to come through because they want to escape the stigma of being in the job centre, uh, you know, one of the kind of things that's very profound in my work, and I'm sure in a lot of the work that uh, you all do using participatory methods, is how government narratives are taken on and internalised within people's lives. So, you know, we've had a kind of very big story in the UK about how people out of work are kind of shirkers and so on. And so people in the job centre believe that. They think that they're looking for work, but everybody else around them is not really looking for Work. And so one of the main things to do is to kind of get out of that situation and try and find yourself with other people who are genuinely looking for work. Although everybody we actually meet is genuinely looking for work. It's just a kind of narrative. And the other thing is that they are convinced that standing in a queue with other people like themselves in the job centre is not going to help. And they're right. Because what I ask people now, I don't know how many of you are students who haven't worked and how many of you are people who have previously been in the labour market. But if you think about, oh, the text has gone off the bottom because I converted the files, but how did you find your last job? If you just think for a moment how you found your last job. You probably found it through a social connection. And even if you applied for a job or you kind of went to the headhunter, it was probably somebody that showed you the job advert, connected you onto that person. And everywhere across the world is the same. Today, 8 out of 10 jobs aren't advertised. So in fact, the best way to find good work and to progress in work is to have a very kind of wide and broad, diverse network of relationships. But of course, the problem is that those people who are concentrated at the bottom of the labour market are those least likely to have those relationships. So, um, so basically, the very, very worst way for all the people who did come through the door in that job centre was to kind of stand in this 1940s queue. But everywhere I look in the world, I see this as something very similar, which is that we continue to kind of reinvest from work to health to education. We're still putting money into systems that look very much like kind of 20th, 20th century factory production lines. Um, and we see these systems are being replicated. Now, when the systems were invented, kind of in the second, at the end of the Second World War, it was a time of complete explosion in new forms of social organisation. So we've got here the kind of UN in 1945, the kind of proliferation of the trades union movement, Oxfam 1942, also the movement, the moment that kind of many state welfare systems were born, including the one in the UK, which was sort of exported. You won't be surprised to hear internationally that kind of the blueprint was translated into many countries, and we basically many countries replicated the sort of essential blueprints. 
And all of these systems and organisations were designed to kind of uh, ameliorate this deep stress of war, the kind of economic obsession of the 30s that had preceded it. And there was this ambition, which all of these institutions talked to, for a new social global order. There was this idea that there had to be profound social change, and that the kind of the, the benefits of the last industrial revolution of mass production should be kind of spread, and there had to be a way to find how this kind of new world order could be used to improve people's lives. And I see kind of the history of IDS and the work that's gone on here very much in that kind of historic tradition. But what I want to argue this evening is that today, to create social change of that kind of magnitude, we need a similar kind of social revolution. And that the systems and institutions and organisations that were very much designed in this era and kind of in this mould can't really confront the challenges of today. And that we've got to radically reinvent how we frame the problem, how we design and implement the solutions, and then how we collaborate for social change. So as Melissa said, oh, because we converted my files, that's not, huh, they have jumped around, that's really, really weird, but anyway, never mind. Um, we had to kind of convert them from a program that I used. But anyway, I started out um, about three decades ago working in Africa and Latin America in communities like this, kind of in situations that I'll be kind of very familiar to, to most of you here. And in these communities, poverty was very acute, it was very obvious, and the need for change is very stark. And I started off working for, um, in the humanitarian wing of the guerrilla army, and then I worked for a very large, well-known international NGO, and finally I worked for the World Bank. And in all of these institutions, I was part of these very well-intentioned programs for change. And I learned a lot from the people I worked with. But what I saw again and again was the way that the kind of mores and culture of these institutions seemed to kind of trip up the very change they were trying to make. And so um, organisations like the World Bank being a very good example produce documents that might look extremely, I mean British policy documents are the same, they look very logical on paper, but somehow kind of when they come into contact with communities, the change that happens is not what's anticipated and actually often kind of much more complicated or worse than is anticipated. And so I kind of wanted to think about how we could work differently. And I had this kind of growing uh, feeling really that something was missing and that I had to work and get and learn again. And I came here to IDS where um, I think my fellow students as well as the faculty were really critical to my formation. And many of the teachers I had made their mark, but two I'd kind of like to really um, mention. So one was a public administration course run by Robin Murray. Actually, I've got the pamphlet, which is kind of, I'm sorry, I've disappeared off the screen for a moment. But this was the bulletin of this course in the public administration, which I've used so much it's kind of held together with a kind of bulldog clip. And the other was the teaching of Robert Chambers. And both Robin and Robert used to teach to totally packed rooms. I'm sure it's still the case today for Robert. And Robert kind of taught both doing agricultural and rural options, but I was doing the urban options, so I didn't really kind of fit and I wasn't able to take his courses. But he did kind of have these very open workshops as well, and I went to those, and I can honestly say that they kind of changed how I worked and changed me, really. And so I realised that I had to kind of step outside the institutions and learn again, and I moved to this barrio, the Dominican Republic, about 40,000 people living in a network of uh, sewers. And I started out there really just living there and with no agenda, which was very interesting because these were places where previously I'd done research and I had also previously worked. And I found that when I went back with no agenda to live, I learned, you know, as the work of Melissa, for instance, Lie of the Land, you know, a, a big tradition here at IBS, if you go without an agenda, you learn very different things about places that you might have been before or been told other things. Um, and so um, I began sort of just living there and then I began slowly to kind of develop methods. And so kind of on the, the, the kind of bigger picture is just a group of women that I worked with um, and some work we did. And then on the kind of the smaller thing is the design process that I kind of then started to develop. Because when I left the barrio and came back to the UK, I was thinking about how can I use the kind of methods that I have been able to do to kind of elicit different stories, to kind of reach into emotions, to begin to think about system change. And I felt that kind of the very sort of, I would laugh, be laughed at basically in Scotland if I worked that way. And so I started out working with architects and, and I found that quite difficult. And then kind of I began to work with designers and we can talk a bit about how this process works and kind of how it's participatory, how it interacts with the digital world and then kind of how I use it in particular to think about how I can work quite small in a way that really impacts 
in a large way on systems. And I've continued to kind of iterate and evolve this um, through the work I've been doing. But what, what I think is really important is the work I do starts outside institutions. So I think that often when I say this in the UK context, everybody kind of nods along because everybody in the UK does lots of focus groups and participatory work and so on. But what they do that is different, I think, to the work that I do and the work that many of you do and I definitely learnt about here, is that they're going and they're saying, how can I fix this service? How can I make this institution better? How can I you know, run, run this particular aspect of the health service better, for example? And I'm not doing that. I'm actually sitting alongside people, as many of you are here, and saying, what is your life like? What would it mean for you to flourish? What's already working? What can we build on in a really, really open way without any kind of predetermined agenda that I might be about to need to work on? And so through this work, I meet people like Anne. And Anne um, is unwell. She's overweight. When I meet her, she can't reach up to wash her hair. She can't run for a bus. And she says that she's lost herself. And so most of her life is spent actually keeping appointments with nine specialist doctors, which in some parts of the world might be considered a blessing that she has these nine free doctors. But actually, um, it, it's not really making a difference. And when I bring all the nine doctors together to look in a group for the first time at what they've prescribed for Anne, they say, as she already knows, that nothing is making a difference. None, all but one of them decide that they should remove themselves from her life. And I think actually, if I recollect, they also remove all but one of her, her medications. But I think that Anne represents the biggest challenge to kind of health systems globally, which is how to shift from these very hierarchical systems, which she were designed to combat chronic disease, uh, infectious disease, to new systems that could deal with kind of infectious disease. Because our health systems, I think, are perhaps the most perfect model. In fact, actually, I was talking to Melissa about this at lunch today, so it's a kind of coincidence I was going to talk about it, but I think they're like the most perfect model, if you like, of the industrial systems that we've um, inherited. Because you're ill, you're kind of, you become a number, you're placed in a bed, you move along. I mean, it really is an industrial system. Um, it's all highly kind of sort of integrated in a very kind of vertical way. So knowledge and power is absolutely concentrated at the top. To get anything done, you have to kind of keep passing knowledge up and down through these very complicated levels. It's very expensive. It takes a very long time. And you know, today, 70% of the expenditure in these systems goes on people who can't be cured. So it goes on kind of continually managing these illnesses and conditions which are kind of socially rooted and need to be kind of confronted socially. And yet in these clinical models, it's very expensive and nothing changes. Um, last month, I was in China, for instance, where 143 million people have diabetes and they're spending 400 plus billion RMB a year on a clinical model of diabetes, which is more than a kind of the GDP of many countries. So, I mean, I think the other thing is, and I kind of see this, for instance, when I go to countries like Mexico, is that there's also a kind of, there's a strong sense of many countries trying to get into these kind of clinical models because they're expected culturally at the very moment that actually many countries in the world should think about how they can kind of leapfrog those cultural models, these industrial models, and move to something which is kind of much more 21st century, much more distributed and basically horizontal. So it includes professionals, yes, but peers, neighbours and so on and work that can work in a different way. And these are the models that could support Anne and billions like her to kind of begin to, in the first stage, hopefully prevent those conditions, but then to kind of manage them and live good lives despite, despite kind of multiple conditions. So in the book Radical Help, um, I... I I talked about the kind of three core reasons why I think we need this social revolution and why I think we've got to kind of leave behind those kind of post-industrial or those industrial models that we're kind of very fond of but really don't work anymore. And the first is that we face a whole series of new problems in this century that weren't foreseen when kind of the institutions and actually I think our mental mind maps were kind of formed. So one example is ageing, kind of a huge problem with isolated rural elderly in China, but also big problems of loneliness here in the UK, um, challenges of mass migration, uh, obesity, chronic conditions I've already talked about, uh, the challenge of living on a fragile planet. And the argument that I would make is not just that most of these problems weren't thought about when our institutions were designed, it's that actually these problems are very different in nature because they all need mass participation to be solved. You know, we're not going to be able to solve the problems of climate change by kind of directs from the top. It might play one part, but no matter how great our leaders are, we're going to have to get involved. And it's the same with managing chronic conditions, living well when you're aging, and so on. 
And the characteristic of these post-war systems is that they're designed to keep us out, to manage us at arm's length. You know, they are about kind of vertical systems, you're at the bottom and you will be managed. And they're unsuited for this kind of problem. So that's reason number one. The second is that these uh, institutions, whether we're thinking about Oxfam or the British Welfare State or whatever, were designed in very different socioeconomic circumstances. And so I've already talked a bit about kind of, you know, the industrial revolution we're going through, but also, of course, we've gone through a social revolution. So all these models were designed um, on the idea, and still often are, of women's unpaid labour. So, um, you know, in the UK system, beverage, we didn't know what to do about care for very young children or for um, our ageing parents, and he kind of swept it under the front door and said that would be women's work, that would be unpaid work. And that problem broke down in the 1960s, but we've never found ways to really think about it, to think about how these kind of, how care interacts with kind of good work and so on. It's still something that's siloed. We've tried to solve in this country, we've tried to solve it with market mechanisms which have really deeply failed. Um, so that's one problem. And I think that it was always the case that we had these kind of, to some extent, um, models that were based on, on transactions and so on. But that actually, with the introduction of the market, as people tried to kind of reform um, things that they could see kind of in the 60s were breaking down, uh, the problems intensified. So one of the things that kind of was core to this sort of public administration course was what happens when you've got kind of state forms that were in invented after the Second World War and you begin to kind of introduce the market to, to try and kind of, uh, to try and modernise. <coughs> and one of the things that happens is that actually uh, services and uh, solutions get even further <coughs> equal because market mechanisms are kind of even more transactional, they're all around managing risk, they're around competition. So if you want to kind of involve communities in kind of very ad hoc iterative ways, well that's kind of against what you bid for. If you kind of want to see the same doctor again in the UK, well that's not possible because that's not kind of an efficient market mechanism and so on. So lots of problems that were kind of designed in from the start have actually kind of intensified in recent years. And so that, those kind of changing socioeconomic structures are the second reason that I think we're kind of in trouble. Um, and I think there's something deeper as well, which is that those post-war institutions had mindsets, they had education systems, which we're all part of. And one of the things that they taught, and that I'm sure all of you still see, is that there's this kind of unspoken idea that the troubles we face are temporary blips. So the classic thing would be uh, unemployment, which in our welfare systems was expected to be a kind of temporary blip, and then you'd get back to stable work. Whereas in fact, you know, all of us, and definitely looking at the kind of demographic in this room, all of you are going to have at least 11 uh, jobs in your lifetime, between 11 and 20, and you'll have kind of continual blips as you move in and out of work. Health is another thing. You used to have a kind of illness that you were cured when you die, but now most of us have been to live for a long time with kind of a multiplicity of chronic conditions. And so we need a kind of different mindset which sees that in this industrial revolution, instability is normal, that there's constant change, constant flux, and we need to kind of design our solutions and our institutions around this kind of constant movement. But then the third challenge to the systems we have is poverty, because it was assumed that um, poverty would be addressed. Definitely in Britain, the founders of the welfare state thought that the welfare state would cure poverty. And I've had some conversations with people this afternoon, you know, um, starting out here 30 years ago. I never kind of imagined that, you know, Britain would become poorer, that global inequality would kind of really become accentuated. And yet that's what's happened. And I think the other thing is, you know, I mean, in Britain we haven't achieved any of the SDGs apart from number six, I think, on, on sanitation and water. So kind of everywhere there's kind of big struggles. And I think the other thing that has you know, poverty has morphed and changed shape, and it's still about money, but the big difference is it's also about relationships. So increasingly, social research here in the UK, but also in other countries such as the US, is saying that uh, we don't know each other anymore, and who you know, just as the example I showed with work, matters pretty much more than anything else. It depends, it, you know, on that rests your dependency to get a good job, whether you will have good health, whether you will be well cared for at the end of your life, all of these depend on dynamic and diverse relationships. And yet, um, for instance, the work done by Professor Mike Savage here in the NFC, he can predict, according to your postcode, exactly who you know. Because such has been the intensification of incomes, again, through kind of digital changes which have got sort of dizzying algorithms and high finance at one end and kind of lowly paid work of care at the other. We just don't know each other anymore. And this is having a huge impact on our lives. And it is something that these systems and institutions designed at the end of the war simply can't see, let alone address. It's just not in their frameworks of reference. 
So I think that all of these three changes mean that we can kind of, we can tend to those institutions a bit, we can kind of hold back the tides for a while, but eventually they will kind of take over and, you know, we will be flooded. And so we need to, instead of kind of trying to build dams, we need to work within them, with them, and we need to think of a different way forward. So what did we do? So what we did was we asked all of those who work, walk through the kind of fake door in the job centre if they would like to come back and work with us again. And we kind of met in pubs and bars and we just asked everyone who came through the door what they would do. There have been hundreds of attempts at kind of changing sort of welfare systems in the UK, work welfare systems, and we know they've all failed. So we kind of said, well, what would you do? And this is how I work. I work very small. I tinker. It's kind of digital mindset, you know, try something out, it fails, try it again, it's cheap, fail early, and so on. Um, and, you know, as I say, traditionally, even if we do consult with our communities, what we then do is we, um, I'm talking here in the UK, not for all of your work, but even if we do go consult, we then kind of build a solution and still try to roll out through an industrial pipeline, and we kind of didn't want to do that. So we invented something um, that we call Backer, and Backer is a community of people in work, out of work, and in between. So it's not a jobs club, it's basically about kind of pulling those relationships together and creating communities where people who've got good work, maybe they like their work, maybe they want to change their work, maybe they're kind of in an in-between moment, as well as people who are quite far from the labour market joining together. And um, you have to kind of think that we have these meetings in these public places and they're a bit like a cross between a sort of Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and the kind of speed dating. Everybody's kind of getting together and we've got very simple kind of practical tools that help people break down their problems and think about what, what they want to do next. And the traditional way of, the, of looking at employment, pretty much everywhere around the world, is to say, what are your formal qualifications? And then if you're not kind of just starting out, how long have you been out of work? And on those two, you're classified. And we don't do any of that. What we say to people is, what do you dream of doing? And who do you need to know to take the first step? And then we'll connect you to that first step. And then you'll stay with you and we'll carry on connecting you. Because at least in Britain, progressing and finding good work is actually much harder than finding a job. It's quite easy to find a crap job, but it's very difficult to find a good job. Um, and so this system helps us to do that. And so on a kind of randomised control trial of our work, our work costs 20% of any standard employment system in Britain. 54% uh, of those who have uh, been out of work for a long time find work, 87% progress, and 100% grow their kind of rural capabilities. And the work is made possible by technology. <coughs> so what we have is always we have small teams, and then we, have, um, we use technology to ensure that we can connect people together in very cheap ways. We use kind of mobile phones, we use kind of, um, we hack kind of standard customer relationship management systems, kind of standard platforms. And this upends traditional business models because we are working with thousands of people with very small teams and yet keeping the kind of nature and very sort of small human interactions that are keeping the communities there. And it's also very low cost. Um, and then the other thing I think that's really important is it means that we're not dependent because we've got these systems or more brilliant charismatic entrepreneur who might be able to kind of make the system work and, and roll it out. But what's very important is that this backer and all the work is not kind of, this is not about kind of doing a LinkedIn for the unlinked. It's about getting face to face and building kind of human connections, but using this as a kind of interface to make it happen. Because most of the people that I work with in the UK are not functioning online. And in that sense, it's no different to, let's say, somewhere like Yemen, where 15% of the population are online. And most of the communities I work in are actually pretty similar. People might have an email account. If you ask them, they tell you they're online, they've got an email account. But that really means going to join a very long queue in the library to kind of access your email account. So functionally, you're not, in my view, online. So anyway, we applied apply the same kind of principles to help. We kind of moved into clinics and we said to doctors, doctors in the UK have something in the category they call their heart sink patient, which means that when the patient walks in, your heart sinks because you know that uh, you basically can't do anything for somebody in a particular 10 minutes slot, which is what you get with your doctor in the UK, um, because their problems are extremely complex and largely socially rooted, even if they might have also kind of clinical manifestations. So we trained a kind of small team of what we call relational workers. And these, uh, this team, so the doctor sends a uh, patient to the relational worker who frankly isn't interested at all in um, the medical conditions, it's not condition specific, but very interested in people's lives and what they want to do, kind of unpacking the whole kind of huge 
sort of arena of problems. And Anne said to Amy in her work, well, what I'd really like to do is I'd just like to kind of take up my embroidery again. And so Amy said, okay, great, let's try that. And so just starting out where people are, whatever builds confidence, whatever builds motivation, and then kind of building up. And again, connecting people into wider communities to sustain change. And so it looks very unorthodox, it doesn't look like health at all, but our, um, I mean, our, our outcomes over time are kind of clinically very impressive for the UK, which is 64% sustaining improvement, 72% of engaging with work, 75% sustaining weight loss. So this is just, we've got loads of kind of clinical indicators, but this is just to give you a kind of few examples to say that this kind of very broad approach can also kind of have an impact on very traditional indicators. I've got quite a lot, I've got a sort of whole thing about measurement in the book, which I probably haven't got time to go into. I'm very skeptical of randomised controlled trials and all traditional measurement, but because we have to grow our work in the UK policy context, we have different measures, but we also do play the game, if you like, to show how the work costs less and um, works better. So all of this work is testing, oh, yeah, so I was going to say just that I've used it um, just to say that we, I mean, the book goes cradle to grave. I work with older people, I work with families in Britain and across Europe and so on. So we've used the same kind of approach in many different settings. And it's led to the development of this framework, which isn't a theory. It's kind of being developed through practice and then kind of tested again in practice. And I'm not going to kind of go all the way through, but I do just want to kind of talk about the first two. So the first thing that is really transformative, sounds so kind of simple and obvious, but really is to recover the vision. Because as I said, in the 1940s, globally, we thought really big about what we wanted to happen. But over time, and partly, I think, through some of the arguments in this kind of ideas bulletin about new forms of public management, we have kind of, we've, we've sort of narrowed down. And we've begun to think much more about how we fix problems, about how we kind of get to short-term outcomes. It's become much more sort of um, de-reduced in the way that we kind of looked at it. Um, and so what I'm saying is that we need to kind of raise our heads and think again about those original visions and reinterpret them. And I actually think that this is a kind of really, really particular moment in history now. Because I think we're hearing all kinds of global narratives about how, because of the fifth industrial revolution, digital and so on, that there will be winners and losers, as if it's sort of inevitable that there will be winners and losers. And then the conversation moves to, so what are we going to do about the losers? You know, we can have systems of universal basic income, or Gates says they can have some low-cost robot and so on. But I think it's not acceptable. It's like, if we go down that, that narrative and have that vision, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And what we need to do is kind of reinvent our history and say, no, that's not enough. Every industrial revolution has moved kind of whole swathes of the global population out of poverty. In the last one, it was blue-collar workers. In this one, it needs to be a completely different form of globalisation that, in a kind of way that is kind to the planet, moves everybody forward. And that has to be our vision. So in the book, I kind of talk about human flourishing very much in a sort of Aristotelian way about what it actually means to flourish. And then the goal has to be, and that's the goal of my work, is how we ensure that everybody has that chance to flourish, no matter kind of where they're born or, or where they start out in life. But then that comes to the second thing, because in order to kind of make <coughs> some sort of kind of political narrative that is about opportunity, we have to think about, so what, what really can we do to make this not just a kind of dream and a vision, but real in people's lives? And um, so I think we have the new kind of approach that goes away from managing need that just pops up the weakness to one that fosters broad and collective capability. And one of the things, I mean, I kind of work anthropologically, living in people's homes alongside people. A lot of the stories in the book are kind of, you know, when I move on to an estate and I live alongside people and what I learn. But I do the same with professionals in the welfare systems that I work in. And what I have tracked, you know, in health and social work, is that 80% of the resource available goes on the system itself. On managing the queue, filling out forms, log frames, applying for money, and basically, all of that is around kind of programs to manage need. And all of my work is about turning that on its head and saying, let's take that 80% out and let's use it to grow the capability. So the capability framework, which was developed by Martin Sen, the economist, and Martin Nussbaum, the philosopher, is probably quite familiar to many of you because it's been used in a kind of developmental context for so long. But in the UK context, it's not unheard of, but it's much less used. But um, I work with it because it starts with this kind of deceptively simple question that says, what can you really be or do? And I think that what's important about it is that it works internally on kind of what we've been told we can be from a young age, what society tells us we can be, 
and externally on kind of actual structural realities. Do I live anywhere where there is actually decent work? And how those dynamically interact? And definitely in UK policy, we tend to kind of either focus on the first internal, like the happiness agendas, just get happy, or we've got kind of quite big macroeconomic stories, but we're not working dynamically on the two. We also tend to talk in quite kind of loose kind of ways about opportunity. And so in the book, I tell stories about people who have opportunity. Young people, for instance, who live here in Walston but can't connect to the wider economy in Brighton, or like a gentleman called Stan who uh, lives in the heart of London but doesn't see anybody more than once a week. Once a week, his carer comes in. Uh, very occasionally, his grandson calls from, um, calls from Canada. But he is part of a kind of epidemic of loneliness of people that don't speak to anybody. I also work, um, I tell the story of a mother called Ella, who lives um, on an estate in Swindon, right next to a Honda car factory. But when I meet Ella, I mean, she hasn't a hope in hell of getting a job at that factory. She hasn't got the right skills, she hasn't got the right wardrobe, she hasn't got the right teeth, I mean, you name it, that really, so many things are kind of mediating between her and those opportunities. So kind of working with a capability framework is a way of kind of unpacking that, looking at internal and external dynamics. It's about power. It's about saying to people, I can't do a capability to you, but I can support you, you lead the change. And so in all work, kind of cradle to grave, I'm working with four capabilities and measuring those. So do we have good work and learning? By which I don't just mean can we get grades at school, I mean really about our facility to learn and continue to learn. Do we have physical and internal <coughs> and mental health and vitality? Are we part of a community which I interpret to mean do we have a kind of very sense of our place in a knitted local community as well as at a kind of global planetary level given the kind of challenges of the environment in particular? And do we have this diverse network of kind of relationships? And actually it's through the measurement systems that we developed that we saw why relationships above all were so kind of pivotal. So as I say, we, have, we tell people that it's about power, we don't tell them it's about power, but we, we kind of invite people to participate, and then we say to people, we'll support you to make change. And often it's really difficult. So in the battle work, for example, people push back, they've been in the queue a long time. When I first started working in kind of cinemas and so on, people would put up their hands and they'd ask me if I could go to the loo as if they were kind of a primary school child. And with my team, we were really, really shocked, but people have been in these terrible systems for so long that they've kind of taken on some of the behaviours, and so they come to us and say, will you fix this? And we say, well, no, we won't, we'll kind of support you, but we're not going to do the fixing. So it's a kind of continual sort of dynamic for it. Um, and then the other thing is about kind of connecting multiple forms of resource. So, you know, we often think we don't have enough resource because it's very silent. We have kind of, you know, state money, private money, time, and all our platforms, our digital platforms, kind of blend that resource together. Very much starting with what's possible, not kind of what's at risk. Um, and then kind of everything I design is universal. I'm interested in how we can design again to include absolutely everybody. And given that the work is very much about relationships, it's great. You know, the more people, for instance, who join BACA, the more relationships, the more opportunities, the more connections. And it's the same kind of with the ageing work I do and so on. So um, the models I describe are still quite small scale. I'm working kind of across Britain. And I'm working with kind of many thousands of people. And actually, I'd like to be working with many millions of people. But the models have been designed to grow, um, but not through kind of a traditional scaling process of mass production, but about thinking about how we can kind of get economies of cooperation going, um, and about how we can kind of grow in a more organic way. And the third part of radical health is dedicated to actually how we can begin to kind of grow these models in new ways. Because I think the fact is that the work I'm describing is actually everywhere. That I'm sure many of you do similar work. But at the moment, this kind of work that doesn't have an agenda, that is about these shifts in power, that is about a kind of broad definition of flourishing. It's very much at the margins of all systems. It's very hard to get it funded. It usually looks very messy. It certainly doesn't fit within kind of traditional metrics and log frames. So it's all about how we can use frameworks like this to kind of make big shifts and begin to grow, I think, what's already out there, but quite marginal. So I'm just going to end by talking about five things that I think could make a really big difference to kind of move the work I'm describing from margin to centre. And then I hope that could be the beginning of, of a discussion we might all have together. So, I'm going to ask you to, what can we do? So the first thing I think we can do is we can reframe the problem. Because I think again and again we're kind of deciding what to work on and what the problem is based on how, what those issues look like within our institutions. 
you know, how do we fix them, I've already talked about, but also what are the problems that we're seeing in this institution, I mean, I don't necessarily mean IDS, but I mean all the institutions we're part of, how can we go out there and solve it? And I tell lots of stories in the book about, you know, how we can kind of upend it, and there's a lot of work here at IDS that has for many decades kind of upended that, but the dominant way of working, and usually when I'm talking, I'm talking to people kind of working within dominant institutions, and the dominant way of working it's still about saying, okay, well, let's, you know, we're, we're experts, let's bring in some people from everyday life, let's learn from them, and let's go away and kind of design our models. And what I'm saying is, no, let's get the experts out into everyday life, and let's completely rethink what actually are the challenges and what are we going to do about them from that perspective. So that's the first. The second is, I think we need to expand the team. So um, there has been a kind of very historically recent, in you know, kind of taking a broader sweep, uh, rise in the dominance of economics and kind of uh, particular ways of counting, thinking and so on. And it's incredible here that you have got an anthropologist as the director of IDS. I just think that is completely amazing. And it's not that I think that we should kind of, you know, obviously economics has got a real role to play, but what I'm interested in is how we very much expand the disciplines around the table, how we look through all these different lenses at once so that we don't flatten stories, but we begin to get kind of different insights, we kind of get out of our silos, and then we see kind of very different possibilities. So that would be the first thing. And I'd be interested to know kind of how interdisciplinary the work is here and where people are with that. The third is that I think we have to start with abundance. So although I think our problems are very different, as I've said, and have grown in some respects, so have our possibilities. And I think two things have particularly grown. One is digital, which kind of is creating trouble, but is also absolutely able to kind of, as I say, up any business models and make new work possible. And at the moment, mostly when I go to look at work, I see kind of the possibilities, the digital possibilities used to prop up old ways of doing things. So maybe we put an old-fashioned curriculum online, or I mean the classic case I always talk about in Britain is that we've used technology to tag prisoners to kind of watch them in a cheaper way rather than kind of educate them. So we keep kind of popping up, but we can use it instead to kind of turn things on their head. And one of the things I use it for is to literally take out that 80% of time on administration to free up professionals in our welfare services with really profound results. So that's one thing. And then the other is actually us, because we're really educated. We really want to change things, and um, the problem is that our systems aren't designed for that. But what I find everywhere I go when I design systems with the grain of everyday life, everybody does want to join in, and that enables me to build communities, not just for those who need support, but those who are willing to give support, who just want to join in, and so on. But one kind of anecdote is that wherever I go, I work with local government, everybody believes my business cases that I would save them money, but nobody believes that anybody where they live will join in when I start. They're always like, well, it's great, you know, we really like to give it a go, but nobody here, you will never build communities like that here. I mean, I'm sure one day I'll get somewhere where that's not possible, but so far that hasn't happened to me. I've always found that kind of using different ways of working means that, and designing different kinds of systems in the job. So the other thing is above all relationships. I think one of the kind of most critical challenges with very vertical ways of working is that they don't see these kind of networks of horizontal relationships. And very, very often, government policy actually serves to kind of undo the bonds that would actually most help us to flourish. And so I've got a very good example. I live in Peckham next to the Aylesbury Estate, which is the biggest housing estate in Europe, which is currently being knocked down. And everybody's being moved all over the place, supposedly to better housing. And we can talk a lot about what's really happening. But one of the things, because I've worked a long time and I've lived there a long time, that is happening is that intergenerational bonds are being broken in that process. So that is a community with all kinds of challenges, but with kind of several generations living together, taking care of elderly relatives. And now that isn't going to be possible. So kind of to solve one problem, the government has gone in and kind of bulldozed the housing, and later we'll come back to another problem, which is that there's no longer any of those kind of bonds there. So I think the most important thing with anything we do, whether it's research or intervention, should be what are the existing relationships? Will what I do strengthen that, or will it begin to kind of erode it? And it has to strengthen it. And then the fifth thing really is to invest in the new. So I think if we kind of use this kind of framework that I'm proposing, and we make sure that everything we did and every investment we made was along those lines, we would make change really fast. Because just to kind of finish on the sort of beverage note of the British welfare state, when the welfare state was invented in this country, not everything was new. Obviously, there were already kind of health systems and education systems. 
But what happened was that a new framework was developed. And then either you joined that framework or you didn't, and you could no longer um, you could no longer work if you didn't. So for instance, doctors really didn't want to join the NHS, but they came kind of kicking and screaming because it was the only way to get paid. And I think we could think as well about what are the kind of things that we could do. We're not going to impose a framework because probably a few of us in this room have power to do that, and anyway, that's not a way to make change in the century. But we can think about what are the kind of incentives, what are the things that we could advocate for that would begin to shift institutions in a quite powerful way, and also divert the source of what's marginal but powerful right now. So thank you very much. wonderful and spot on in terms of time and it leaves us kind of just over half an hour to get a discussion going and let's leave up these five principles I think because they're really important and I love the pictures as well so um so an awful lot there I mean strikes so many chords I think with with the kind of work that many of us in this room have done or have aspired to do perhaps not on the scale or with the degree of tenacity and insight that Hira, you've managed to do. Um, but I think also the connection between what one has learned in some parts of the world and brought to others um, is also enormously inspiring to, to all of us. And we've got a link here in a way between, between theory and real practice, very, very practical practice on the ground, which is again something that's very IDS actually. Yes, um, so really, really exciting to, to hear all of this. And let's now open up a discussion. I mean, perhaps let's take a, a, a round of, of questions or comments or or sharings of things that strike you, maybe, maybe chords that are struck with experiences that you've had. I think you also would like to hear about this. So we'll maybe take three or four and let Hillary come back and then take another round. So hands up if anyone would like to share a thought or a reaction or an experience. Yeah, okay, we'll go here. Shall I just speak up? Uh, we've got a microphone going around, which is probably easier because the room's large. Thank you, that was really interesting. I'm just curious though, who funds your work? Because as you're saying, it's not mainstream at all. And you know, we are, we do live in the constraints of like funder requirements and all of that. So I'm just curious. Yeah, no, very good question. So, who else? Yeah. I have a lot of things I'd like to ask, but I'll start with one. Um, just in terms of the methodologies that you use and where you place yourself, if you could speak a little bit to some of the tools or methodologies you use when you bring the communities together, and where, if at all, you see that line between sort of action research methodologies and also community organizing. Because um, I know too, uh, the, the government has community organizers, I think is the national level thing that does get funding from the government. And they have local branches that obviously are trying to do a lot within communities and building up trust over time and starting with notions of flourishing where you want to be rather than looking at problems and fixing institutions, much like we talked about. So just where your methodologies can sort of lie between those two things. Excellent. And if you go to John, Vanessa, just. Thanks, everybody. That was great, and certainly resonates with a lot of work at IDS and a variety of the teams and clusters. One of the areas we're working on, of course, is the challenge of how to create alternative participatory horizontal systems in an economy that's more and more unequal and driven by the vertical and global forces that you're talking about. And I'm just wondering, you know, there, there is a, we're doing some work about alternative economies that are driven by some of the same principles. Uh, horizontal sharing, social and solidarity economies, starting with what people have rather than what they don't have. And I just wonder if you could talk about the parallels or any intersection you see between the work for alternative social services and alternative forms of economic production. Well, that's a, that's a great set. Do you want to come back on some of those? <laughs> great question. Why don't they? Yeah. Big questions. Though, really good funding method. Funding, yeah. Economy. So I think on the funding, there are two, I raise two kinds of money. So I, I do these quite, um, I do these social innovation projects. They take about a year. So I take a, a, a challenge, let's say aging. 
and I raised money um, for a year to kind of do the work. And during that work, part of the, the part, but part of my kind of uh, methods is to develop a business case. So then the, the ongoing work, so if you went to kind of visit one of the kind of aging enterprises that I started, is funded in a different way to the kind of actual innovation work. So with the innovation work, um, it's a bit of a moving uh, challenge. It's a very, I, I need a million pounds to start a project, uh, more or less. And um, what I usually do is I take something where I'm absolutely sure that everybody is stuck, like aging. And so then I write a kind of very short manifesto and say, Everybody is stuck, nobody's got the answer. Who would like to give me money to actually do something to which I've got no idea what will come out the other end? And, um, and I raise money like that. And I raise it from the government and I raise it from business. And I, I think, um, to be honest, I kind of feel slightly guilt. It's very hard to raise it. I find it very, very hard to raise money. And I would say that 96% of my time is raising money and 4% is doing any work. It's pretty miserable. <laughs> Um, and uh, and I also think the problem is, is that I'm quite old, you know, like I, I'm now able to raise money off, off the back of the success of previous work. I don't know how easy it would be to start out now. And it's something that I write about in the book, it really bothers me because, for instance, most social innovation money in Britain comes from the big lottery or Nesta. If you want £50,000 from big lottery or Nesta, it's really, really easy. If you need a million, it, they're never going to give it to you. I've never had any money out of any of those institutions. And the thing is, you could do some nice work on £50,000, but you can't change a system on £50,000. And we're still at this huge gap in funding work that will kind of challenge the system. And then um, once I get to the business model, that is about, um, that's all kinds of different things. It's about people usually putting in some money or time. Um, it's also about kind of making investors save cases and showing how we're saving money and getting money in that way. So it's a kind of mixture. The methods question is a huge question. I have to say that you have to buy the book. <laughs> because I do go to the book and I go all around the book because it's like such a big question. I mean, I think the whole community organisation thing is really interesting. I mean, obviously, because I work kind of many decades ago in Latin America, I'm very steeped in kind of Freire and all those kind of, you know, Jesuit priests and blah, blah. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting that a lot of those ideas from the 70s have come around again and it's really powerful to draw on. Um, so I think I, how I situate myself is, um, I mean, so one thing is that the whole project is, is a, a prototype, as in a verb, not as in a, you know, like we're constantly iterating and learning. And, and I kind of use it in the book, I talk about Formula One, where even their winning car is a prototype. They're still, immediately when they've won the race, they're going to take it apart and kind of, actually most people, most of my team are kind of completely annoying because they think it's great. And I'm like, no, no, but I'm sure that, you know, that wheel isn't quite right and we can kind of go again. Then. So I think that's really important to each, all the work, the methods are continually changing and the work is, is kind of, you know, in the beginning I didn't kind of have business modeling and right at the front and that became really important to stay in the work. Um, the other thing is that I really, um, more than community organisers, one of the things I've been challenging in the work is the idea of volunteering. Like how really, it, which goes to kind of John's point about the modern economy, basically it is quite difficult to volunteer in the modern world. I mean, students have to work much harder than I have to. Like most people I work with are trying to hold down three jobs and kind of manage their kids. So again, I'm using technology to connect little bits. So for instance, the aging service is classic. If you want somebody to do something at the same time every week, they can't do it. But if you say, would you mind just looking at the app? And oh, you're passing one of this house. Did you drop off the shopping? Sure, but I'll drop off the shopping and I'll say hi. So we're continually reinventing different ways of doing that. There's also a gender thing about that, which is very interesting, but I can see what it's looking at me. No, I should go up the top. Oh, really? Well, one of the really interesting <laughs> things about aging <laughs> work is that um, most uh, people who are able to build any kind of support communities with older people have a problem that only women join. And uh, so the one thing about the aging work is it doesn't mention aging. It's a community of people from 50 to kind of 90 something. And then that's really important because the 50 to 70 year olds, of course, can do a lot of the work and, and, and that's really important. But anyway, one of the things we discovered was that men would never join because no man, as actually the man who runs it says, is like, you know, no man, sorry for the men to be so, I realise in this place I can't be so gentle, but men find it sometimes a little difficult to ask for directions when they get lost. <laughs> and so they're certainly not going to join at something to say that they kind of need help with everything. So what we did was we had this category of helpers and members, and all the men joined as helpers, which was completely fine. They joined to help other people, which was great. And then they found they could join, 
Yeah. I mean, they were exactly the same as the men was, but so also kind of, <laughs> all the time I'm thinking from kind of digital to language, like how can I mix it up to make it possible to build these communities that include everybody, which does go directly to John's point about like how do we do this kind of work. I mean, one of the things is that, you see, I think that participating in welfare systems is a social good because like that's how we get to know each other, whether we can lie in the horrific queue at A&E or, you know, we're in the same class, whatever it is, that's what we need. So the more people in, the kind of stronger it is. I, um, I'm not doing what you're suggesting. I'm making arguments, and increasingly now the work I've started kind of post-book about sort of macroeconomic trends and why they deserve kind of different social solutions, which is the bit that I think leads to the SDGs. But I made a conscious decision. So, for instance, with the ageing work, people kept saying to me, why isn't it a time bank? It would be a perfect time bank. But my feeling was that perhaps lots of people who live in Lewis like that kind of thing, you know. They might be quite open to baking bread and sharing it with their neighbours and say, it's a time bank. But I'm working in communities where, where either, you know, I mean, so for instance, many of the communities I work in in South London have got all kinds of different, you know, sort of... Um, like Ponzi schemes in a way, and saving schemes, and many kind of they bought from kind of their own communities in Africa, and they're now using it in South London. So I can I can I can use all of that, but what I don't want is to build something that means that you are already altruistic when you join. I want to build something that everybody joins, no matter who they are, and that's why I'm also very interested in the work of Mark and Nussbaum because you know that whole thing of how do we incentivize society to be the best people that they can be, and I think one of the kind of most interesting examples of the work I've done is where it's scaled the women in Manchester and they've kind of grown something really, I can't take any credit to it, they've grown something amazing out of it. But they have got this thing called The Deal and what's really brilliant and why I love it is it's, it's nothing to do with their services, it's just inviting people to participate in completely different ways. But I mean, I'm, yes, I'm not answering your question because I, I have to kind of argue for it and a lot of my work is advocacy and that's kind of where the advocacy comes in. Really interesting. Hilary, I'm going to take the opportunity to pick up on something that we were talking about at lunchtime. I'm struck by how, despite the fact that I think to many of us in this room, everything you're doing is development of a particular kind, you don't use that language when you speak. I don't know how much it's there in the book, but the book doesn't have development in the title. You use terms like social innovation, um, human-centered design, and so yeah, on. Yeah, you don't use that, actually. You don't use that. <laughs> <laughs> right, you don't use that. That's a different yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, to what extent does the term development become relevant, have traction in a UK context? Or, yeah. or are there actually other other terms that people prefer to use? So does development have something that, that either doesn't feel relevant to people or is still seen as something that happens elsewhere? Well, I think it's... Yeah. This is, really important and I've thought about this a lot and actually what's been brilliant about speaking yeah. you at lunch and other people today is I think I need to think about this even more. So I do talk about development. Right. And I say that the capability is a development Well theory. that's a development theory. I mean, it's a development theory. theory. And then people yeah. say to me always, well, what do you mean by development? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by development is a kind of organic process of constantly growing and flourishing whatever stage of life we're at. Yeah. And that in a kind of UK context is totally radical. Because if you get a service, it's to fix you to this point, to get to this outcome, to stop taking the drugs, or get to this income level, and then you kind of exit. Yeah. And so I think it's kind of, it's such a big mental shift. Yeah. But I think it's really important to the work here, and kind of I know that, you know, Richard's doing work on universality, because I also think in a context, in a development context, if you can yeah. talk about development. No, we absolutely can, yeah. but some of these ideas are still quite radical in development. But they're less radical in IDS than in some places. Yes, but the thing is, is what do we in Britain have to offer to this debate anymore? Because, you know, when I worked in Mozambique, everybody was kind of from Britain in a kind of British land rover driving around. But now when I go to Africa, no, you know, we're, we're no ones. We're kind of, you know, money is coming from China and other places. But what we do have is intellectual capacity. Yeah. Innovate, innovation in that sense. And I think these development <coughs> are so important to kind of put in that context. Also because they run counter to kind of the, the things that John was asking about, about traditional economic yeah. theories. Yeah. So I think I do do it, and after today I'm going to do it even more. Okay, brilliant. I'm sure how you get on, see yes. how well it goes down in the UK context. So let's have, some, let's have another round of questions or comments or, or shared experience with me really from... from <coughs> things that resonate with you. I'm seeing one stand behind Gary Buzz, yes. 
Thanks, Henry. It's great. Um, I, I suppose my question is around institutions. One of the very last things you said at the end of the talk was we need to think about how to shift institutions. Um, and you also said somewhere in the middle of it that you work outside yes. institutions. And so I'm just wondering if you can reflect a bit on the, the challenges of changing some very entrenched institutions. I mean, I've been doing some work uh, looking, looking at some of these precise challenges around the whole kind of welfare to work thing yeah. in the UK about how that's changing, how private sector institutions are coming into that field. Um, and we're really, I mean, things are changing, there are all sorts of different changes, not all of them very good. Um, but what's really important is the fact that you have got kind of institutional structures which are deeply embedded and are going to take a lot of shifting. And I wonder to what extent you can shift them if you're explicitly in working outside mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, I won't use the mic, sorry. <clears throat> Maybe following on from that, um, I, I thought what you're talking about is really inspirational, it's amazing. Um, but my question is to what extent this type of transformation can happen um, if it's not supported from the top, if, it's, if there's no governmental support behind it. Um, and my experience, I'm a teacher, um, my experience with the, the, the kind of government systems that we have is that the top doesn't want to support this kind of revolution. That they want to hold on to very top-down structures rather than these horizontal models mm -hmm. and the kind of community participation thing. Um, so can this type of change happen without government or how can we change government so that this type of change could happen? Great, so we've got a question coming in from our online Ooh, listeners. Oh, Maybe lots of questions. Let's have one or two. Um, this is from someone watching from Florida. And they talk a lot about um, top down approaches and top down decision making. And they ask how can we create more horizontal alternatives in an unequal economy? Let's have one more. Anybody? Yeah. In the middle here, actually, I'm going to take two. So I have one here, and then Kevin will come to you. Hi, thank you for your talk. It's really inspiring as other people have said. Also, both of them actually to those similar points. And how we're talking about changing this mindset. I also wonder how much of the way that we also define the way that we see people and seeing them as a contributor means something different to seeing them as a protagonist in this process of social change. Um, I'm just a student, but I'm involved in this process of community building that happens around the world. Seeing that it doesn't matter our age or our background, how can we actually work together and use our own ideas to change the societies so that we live in, starting from the community where, um, you know, even though we're individuals, seeing the individual, the community, and the institutions as these three protagonists for change. So I'm just wondering about this idea of like, how we define individual civil society as well. Um, Changes the way that we do it. Great question. So let's, if you can bear one more in this yeah. round. So much. So much. We might just go to Kevin. Yeah, so at some point in the presentation, you mentioned something about that many of the people that you work with say they're online, but they're not actually continuously connected. Mm -hmm. But then several times throughout the presentation, you were also very enthusiastic about the use of digital. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how do you use digital in a way that ensures that these people are not excluded and that they can actually participate just as much as everybody else? Good. Okay, well that's another nice yeah. connection. It's brilliant. And also, yeah. How, uh, <coughs> yeah. And, and actually, the first, there's a kind of thread running mm -hmm. through across the so I So thank you for the question on the institution. I feel like a bit of woolly thinking there, in a way. I'm a bit ambivalent. So, Ultimately, we cannot make change without institutions. We, we need, obviously, we need institutions, and particularly we need kind of uh, structures that support collaboration. But I think, um, and some of my work is inside institutions in some instances. 
So, you know, the work I do with families is deeply inside the belly of the beast, if you like. I'm kind of working inside social work systems, I'm working inside police systems, and I'm kind of working to kind of change those systems from within. Where some, like the Asian work, I'm building things on the sun. And I think when I started this particular kind of set of experiments that are in the book, the, my analogy was a bit like, um, was a bit like Channel 4, which is well, loads of people try to kind of form BBC and they kind of spend hours inside and lots inside these huge buildings trying to kind of change the BBC. But when Channel 4 came along, suddenly the BBC thought, right, okay, like, we need some different kinds of channels and, we, and this would be the kind of good era of Channel 4. We need, you know, we need to kind of, we need to, we need to wake up. And so I think the work, I mean, in a way, I think I'm still a gorilla. I'm looking at where can I make the incursions in the system. And sometimes that is about kind of, you know, being inside the system, working with social workers, thinking about how, you know, of course, all the best social workers also want to do this work. How can I support them to kind of liberate them within the institutions? And then, and then the other is, like, how can I build things that become models? And I guess I'm kind of all the time trying to kind of Step between the two, but I think your question directly relates to the leadership question. Would you the person who asked the leadership question? Because also the ability to work inside institutions greatly depends on leadership. And it's another thing that I try to kind of keep a real nuance in the book. Because on the one hand, I think you know I've written a book not for academics but for the general public for stories that I hope kind of reach a wide readership. Because I think if we wait around, as we saw with Obama, you know, if we wait around for some great profit leader that is going to change things, that's not going to happen. At the same time, I actually think it's completely impossible to change any system, an institution, where the leadership is not open to it. And so definitely when I decide where to work, particularly in the innovation phase, I'm looking for leadership that will really be brave and open. And I'm looking really to put in the UK context the leaders that will be there for at least the next five years because constant churn of people also means that you can't. And one of the things I talk about, back to Formula One, you know, if somebody in the Formula One team changes, it is literally on the front page of the newspaper. When the head of adult social care for a huge community of many, many thousands, I think a much more difficult job, moves after kind of six months, nobody bats an eyelid, but that's what's going on. So I think that finding leadership, like it, it's not about the leadership, it's not, but if that leadership isn't there, it, it won't work. And, um, but it's also about kind of teams, and this goes to the question, good evening, Florida, or good afternoon, I'm like so charmed that somebody is asking me a question from Florida. So um, I, uh, one of the books that is really kind of core to my thinking is a book by Frederick Leloup called Reinventing Organisations, where he takes up historical sweep between kind of very traditional, do you know this work, kind of red and orange being sort of army, Catholic church, um, and then kind of organisations that get more horizontal and participative in their structures to kind of fully self-managing teams, which is kind of what he would call a teal organisation. And I think that um, obviously what I've been trying to build in the work outside the institutions are kind of tier teams which work as fully autonomous horizontal teams that can, that can then kind of take those decisions, set the question making. Is that, are you looking back at the question first and before? If I ask the question, I hope I am. But towards that. Um, now, the next question is about protagonists. Um, so. Oh, there's a lot to say here. I mean, part of it goes back to the question you asked me, Melissa, which is that I work with capabilities. In the UK context, people work with assets, and people immediately try to kind of change my language away from capability to assets. And I don't really like the assets language, because I think you can say that, okay, well, that makes people kind of protagonists of their own future. Of course, it's, it's better than seeing people as needy. But it also is just so kind of um, transactional. It's basically saying, what have you got to contribute to this, really? And you know, it, it very much fits the kind of UK narrative where people have got responsibility and they should just kind of step up and pull up their socks. So why I like the kind of capability framework is that I'm trying to kind of think through that. Because of course it's true that when we contribute, we feel empowered and that's a really important thing, which is a slightly different thing to say, well, you must contribute because otherwise you can't be part of this, you're a kind of free rider. So I'm always kind of trying to, to work in that way. And the other thing I wanted to say kind of in response to your question, which is, you know, we need, you know, there's a lot of this in the book, it's a very, you've asked a kind of really important and big question, but I work in groups, I don't work with individuals. So from the very get-go, my unit of analysis, building, contribution is the group. So when I start to work with people, I immediately say to them, bring your family, bring your relatives, 
um, which is partly kind of like a really thing that Robert taught me years ago about people checking each other's stories and different things coming out. But it's also because I, I just think if you start with a kind of unit of one, you immediately kind of have these individualistic kind of solutions as well, and I'm kind of trying to work around that. So getting on the kind of digital, sorry, I think perhaps I speak very fast and I didn't make myself clear at all. So, yes, it's true. If we invented systems that relied on digital use of people who are members of our communities, we would exclude a lot of people. And we would exclude a lot of people for two reasons. One is that, um, particularly as we go kind of up age groups, people are not online. But also because the last two decades of public service reform in Britain has been about putting the 1950 services online to save money. So when I work in communities, if they think I'm trying to do something digital, what they hear, they don't hear anything except, oh god, this one must have come along to take something off us and to kind of make something that's kind of a bit crap and cheaper and a lot worse. So also for that cultural reason, I just cannot go forward kind of on the digital path in the UK at the moment. So what I do is I kind of use um, digital to kind of transform the infrastructure, basically. So, you know, one of the things that's really, just a very simple thing, is that in the 1950s, when gazillions were sort of put into our welfare systems, they were actually put into buildings, housing, hospitals, schools, and now what happens is that gazillions go back into kind of propping up those systems, which actually we largely don't need. We do need some, we obviously need a lot more housing. I mean, so, I mean this has got to also be new, so I mean, somebody will kind of be immediately there government saying, what should you say we don't need to build? And of course, in some places we do. But really what we need is kind of very different forms of infrastructure. And that's what I'm using. I'm mean, using platforms to kind of take out all the costs, take out all the administration, take out all that kind of form filling that not only takes up time, but begins to define. I mean, I tell stories about how relationships can't be built between people because actually if you're a social worker, you're trying to extract the information to your form and then you can't also build a relationship at the same time. So that's one thing. And then I kind of use mobile phone devices. And then if people want to use that, they can access everything through that. But nothing is designed to have it be kind of access through that. But, what, but also just to say that everything is designed with a digital mindset. So th those system designers are in my team from the very beginning. And I think we think digital, which is really profound to the way that we kind of design things, even though it probably won't end up as something digital. Great response. Well, I think we've got time for one sort of final round before we let Hillary have a drink and continue. Um, so, Linda. Yeah. Uh, I'll just talk maybe if you know me. Thanks very much. It's really, really interesting. Thanks very much. It's really, really interesting. Um, I want to ask you a slightly different question. Um, Part of this is about transforming institutions, and you've spoken a lot about changing the system and thinking differently about the system. So I guess my question is, to what extent do you feel you have transformed institutions, or, or to what extent have you kind of taken pressure off institutions by making alternative systems available for some? And if you have made alternative systems available for some, to what extent are those long-term or short-term and when you talk about using groups and creating these teams and expanding these teams and focusing on relationships, all of which I think are really important and really inspirational, what are the things that get lost? So, for example, where does accountability lie in the system? Where does responsibility lie? If something goes wrong, how does one trace backwards in a sense? Um, and, and I suppose it's just to say, are we, are we on the cusp of thinking about new kinds of institutions, or is this kind of way of taking some of the problems out of institutions, but still having institutions to do some of the other <coughs> fundamental work that can't be resolved in this kind of way. Okay. That's quite a lot there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, okay, who else? Yep, yeah, so just behind here. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, <coughs> I have two questions. And when we talk about uh, systems, do we talk about systems and managers of systems and users of systems and environment of systems separately? Or do we see at all of this as a whole and consider it as a system? Uh, because these are two different approaches, I believe. <coughs> Second question is uh, systemic transformation, I think, is also about uh, making people uh, reflect 
and develop a shared vision. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, in my experience, is, is the challenge. Uh, how to bring people not just together, but to make them have a shared vision. Uh, so what are the methodological approaches, tools, uh, perspectives available uh, for this? Thanks. Anybody else at this point? Yes. Uh, very good talk. Um, I was just wondering, um, it seems like the, your whole idea is about sort of reinforcing localization, promoting localization, promoting the idea of community, again, which has perhaps been lost through market mechanisms. If this were to be upscaled or um, done on a national level, how would you see those local communities interacting with one another? Would, would it just then become one homogenous entity, or would it become separate entities that, that coexist together? Or just how would how would they merge? How would that work as a as a whole within the? Yeah, we can have another online. Yeah. Where in the world it's coming from this time? <laughs> Um, so a large number of existing community groups are based around religion and faith, particularly in London. How do you engage with or not with those existing groups? Very good question. So is there one more last question or comment before we go? Yes, over here, before we go back to Hillary. So the, Um, I'm quite new to sort of theories around this, so I don't know if it's a good question or not. Um, but what you're talking about to me sounds like you've got a kind of section of society who's looking to help, um, who aren't currently engaged in systems that are not working, and then a section kind of the other side of it that's kind of got the information and the tools who's potentially able to sort of facilitate impact on that. And I'm just wondering about there's obviously like a massive portion of people in the middle there, um, who perhaps this current system to work for or don't really need to engage or don't feel they've been inspired to engage outside of that. And I just wonder how their interaction and this development sort of can be a problem really help. Mm -hmm. Alright, well that's a really good question. Um, so I'm going to ask you another long problematized concept in development, but one that you're using in a rather different way, I think. So, yeah. Let's have a final, final so round of got, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think this will be a final, and any last words you'd like to make before we all head down? So I think that I'm going to start with the last question and kind of lead it to the, to the institutional question. I mean, I would say that in terms of population, help, not help, I'll come back to, but like enthusiastic and not enthusiastic, let's say when I arrive in the community, like who thinks I'm mad and who thinks yes, I would say that um, that both of those are quite small, most people are pretty agnostic, you know, in the beginning. But one thing that I do do is that, you know, I kind of take a standard, if you take a standard deviation curve, I say that most social science designs for the norm, and I don't. I look for where are the most extreme outliers, and I design there, because then I know that I will have everybody because everybody else kind of will be in the middle. But I also wanted to kind of pick up on your help, not help, because one of the things, um, and, and I think it's the kind of institution question, which I'm just trying to think, I really want to say a million things about that question, so I'm just trying to think, what can I actually say? But, um, the thing that I find most difficult, and my book was published in June, and I've been around kind of lots of literature festivals, and I've met thousands of members of the general public now, and kind of also talked a lot to kind of professional bodies. It's very, very hard for conversations not to descend into some kind of sense of there's those people over there that need help, and there's us over here who don't need help. And really what the book is about is that there's no such division between those two. Like, all of us are going to need help at some stage in our lives. And, you know, the ageing crisis, as it's seen, because it's only a crisis in current institutions, it doesn't need to be, um, is, a, is a really, really good example of that. And I also think, you know, but it's very difficult because it's back to kind of the economic question of growing and quality and haves and have nots, and it's become very, very hard to have that conversation. And that was also one of the reasons for writing the book. I'm not sure how well I've done because I do see conversations go back to that. 
But I would kind of leave that to kind of institutions transformed, should they be new, what gets lost. I'm very conscious of what gets lost. When Beveridge invented the welfare state, lots of really, really important things got lost. And I write about those things, like the Peckham Health Experiment, like lots of community work, which couldn't, which not anybody basically that was doing community work that kind of self-funded itself got lost when the welfare state was invented. And lots of my models draw on that pre-Beveridge kind of idea and reinvent it. So in anything new, something gets lost. Um, when you say alternative for some, it is true. So, for instance, my family work um, is only an alternative for those really who are most at the margins and most. I would love that work to be for everybody because you know, I and mean, what you know, most the majority of couples in Britain today get divorced. They end up in family courts, and the kind of financial costs as well as the emotional costs. Well, the emotional cost is big. The financial cost is exactly twice what we spend on the families who have social services that we're always talking about in the newspaper. So I think it would be great to kind of provide support to everybody. But the work I do on families only provides support to those who kind of most need it. So, so there is kind of some of that. Um, I think that we need new institutions. I think that transforming institutions is, is kind of like a lot of energy for very, very little gain. But I do also accept that some things, so like if we take the health service, we need a completely radically different form of health service. I think mean, it is completely broken. But we are still going to need efficient hip replacement. So it's kind of not totally either or. And I don't know if you know the work of Anne Marie Slaughter, her foreign policy work on kind of chessboard and the web. And that's quite interesting because she says, like, what things should still be chessboard? Like, obviously, hip replacements need to be chessboard. But what things need to be web? or of chronic conditions, which is basically most of our health challenges, need to be well. So I think that, you know, that we do have to think really differently. And what I really think is important is that, um, is that and this goes to kind of another, another question that somebody asked about um, kind of the system and the whole, uh, you asked two questions about the system. Um, so one of the things that's happened in Britain that I think is kind of deeply damaging with the kind of last sort of couple of decades of reform is that there was this pitting of the user against the profession. Like, professionals capture vested interests, user, very, very good. And, you know, all the work I do is about, is about trying to think of outside that. Partly I talk in the book about how everybody uses the same language about each other and their stuff. But also what's really important is that these old institutions are impossible places to do good work in. You know, nurses have a very high suicide rate in Britain. There are 93,000 vacancies in the, in the National Health Service. One third of midwives aren't working. 70% of um, London schools that have had teachers. I mean, you know, like, these are places which it is too stressful to work in and therefore too stressful to reform from within and that we do need to kind of really, really think anew. So I definitely think about the whole system and I would never divide those levels up conceptually in the way that I work at it. To, to kind of answer your question. And then I think kind of the vision um, is really, really important. And that's why the book puts out a vision. I mean, I'm not saying that I've got the vision that everybody's going to take up. But I am very, very clear that the reason we got a welfare state was pressure from below, pressure from above, and a kind of baggy shared story that was kind of strong enough about what we could be that, that people could tell it themselves, but baggy enough that it didn't really matter where you came from in Britain or what kind of family that you could kind of interpret it yourself. And I'm trying to tell that story in the book, you know, not because I think I'm beverage, but because I think until we begin to tell those stories, it's very hard to kind of shift systems. So I think it was a really good uh, kind of observation, really. So, promoting the localization, well, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, you said about how I use language differently. And, of course, I am working in a UK context where I'm very skeptical about localism. Because localism that I see means moving uh, very big 1950s structures from the centre to replicate them at local level, which sometimes can be even worse, but certainly is no better. So I am very interested in thinking kind of horizontally, kind of locally. Um, but also, I mean, I think, you know, if you think about the challenges we face in this century, they are very local and they are very global. And the question is how to link those two. And the problem with all our institutions is that they're completely unsuited for that. You know, whether it's the European Union or the UN or, you know, I, I'm, I'm in favour of, you know, obviously global institutions, but they, they as well, they're just completely unsuited. How do I think that these kind of sector entities will join up? We've had some experience of that. So, for instance, growing kind of circles, thinking about perhaps we can have about 2,000 people who are a membership, and beyond that, it's not kind of local. 
So this again is where we can use digital to kind of scale. We can say, well, everybody can use the same platform, but then, you know, to give an example, Rochdale Circle, Adrian Circle, will look really different to uh, a circle in, in a city, because um, in, in a kind of flourishing city where there's very good transport, because Rochdale people are kind of more spread out, so we've got to kind of think about. So we kind of go, and we implant ourselves, and members of existing teams, and then we kind of look at what's really strong and local and how can we build for that kind of locality. But in that way, they kind of see themselves, really. Oh, wow, I and mean, if we ever got so so kind of massive that all of these were kind of jostling up against each other, I would have just been very heaven, and I would think that's just amazing. I we're so far from there. But um, that's kind of... Uh, that's... Um, yeah. But it sort of leads to the next question about religion and faith. I wish I knew which country this person was asking the question from. So when I wrote the book, yeah, when I wrote the book, um, there was an annex of uh, because the book is a story of kind of work I've done, and I, there was an annex of other people's work that I thought reflected this. Partly because I think it is really important to say there's a lot of work out here, and publishers took the work out. They said this is just nobody's going to read this book, and they took it out, which I, I thought I don't like because it makes it feel it's an egotistical. But it was really striking how much of the examples I had in the book grew out of faith groups. And I think that's because they think developmentally. They don't think like, you know, oh, hello, what's your problem, how can I fix it? They think, oh, well, this family is part of our community, they might be going through trouble now, or they're with us forever. And I think that it kind of makes sense that kind of faith groups would be, would be part of this. In the work that I do, I, um, this is kind of, I don't know that I really want to end on this, so I have this. But um, what's really important is that the platforms make visible very local communities. So again, to go back to the kind of ageing work, we would go and sit in Rochdale and we would look at what local organisations are there and what are they doing, and then we'd link them to the platform so we wouldn't replicate those kind of things. So very local community organisations like it because they become more visible, they become connected, and they become uh, you know, part of something bigger that fits their ethos. The, the very large national so-called voluntary organisations always find it a lot more threatening because their money comes from, you know, dealing out statutory services which often we're thinking sound a bit more kind of old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. But that seems a bit like not the most positive note to end with. What can I say is positive? Mm -hmm. I it's so great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, so brilliant I think what we'll do is um, adjourn downstairs right. for a very positive drink. But I just want to <laughs> Before we have a great big round of applause for Hillary, I just wanted to say really four things that have struck me as really things that relate to this whole lecture series. Um, one is about universality, but in that, not just about, I and mean, what actually really struck me in the talk was it's not just about the UK has lessons for other parts of the world and vice versa, but actually it's about every single one of us. Yes. I'm very struck by what you said about we're all, we're all helpers, we all need help. And, and actually that sense of, of, of community and of breaking down those boundaries and in, in as much as development has ever been about helping people, actually we're all both subjects and agents of, of this creative process. So that's, that really struck me. Second, the anthropologist in me was really interested in interrogating I and mean, in what you said really about culture. A lot of this is about culture and some quite profound problems in audit cultures, in a culture, cultures in our institutions that identify problems, that think about things in terms of risk yes. and closing down to risk rather than embracing stability oh, and uncertainty. Um, that's a big part of the work, but yes. So as well as culture in that sense, more about community relationships. I think we need to think about institutional culture. Um, and then I think the whole theme of transformation, which is something that we're engaging with a great deal here at IDS these days, and thinking about transformations coming from the bottom up as much as from the top down, and very much about what happens in the middle. We're talking about transformations of institutions and actually transformations of power, which interestingly is a word that hasn't come up very directly, but has been implicit in everything you've, you've said. And finally, I mean, just returning it back to the SDGs, which is, of course, the, the theme of, of, of these Sussex Development Lectures, I think you've said so much about how one people, countries, localities might go about tackling particular SDG challenges, and actually often reframing them. Mm. But, but as much of this, I think, also speaks to some of the problems of the SDGs being in silos and being around 17 specific problems or 169 particular 
littler problems around which you can have indicators because of course the, the people you're working with live interconnected lives in which those interconnected SDG related challenges are all interconnected and need to be addressed in that kind of way. So I think you've laid out some profound challenges as well as opportunities for how, how the SDGs themselves might be addressed. But anyway, um, haven't read the book and now going to with great enthusiasm and I would encourage all of you to, but please join me in thanking Hilary for a fantastic piece of